a guy was late for a meeting, and he just couldn't find a parking spot. You ever been there? Someplace downtown usually is when you're looking for those parking spots, and you just can't find anything. And so he'd driven around the block several times, and he had to get to this meeting. And so finally, he just simply parked illegally. And he left a note on the windshield that said this, Dear Mr. Policeman, I've circled this block ten times and my boss will fire me if I'm late for this meeting. Please don't give me a ticket. And then he added a little spiritual emphasis to it and said, Forgive us our sins. So he came back and sure enough, there was a ticket on his windshield. And on the back of the ticket was written this, Dear Sir, I've circled this block for 10 years, and my boss would fire me if I didn't give you a ticket. <laughs> and then added, lead us not into temptation. <laughs> so that's what we're going to talk about here today. How do we say no to temptation? You know, temptation is common to all of us. We've all experienced it. We've all faced it. And some seem to come to a faith in Jesus and think everything will just be wonderful. All their temptations will go away. Life will be so much easier. I'll never have to deal with any of these negative things in my life because I'm now a child of God. I'm a Christian. Yeah, well, that's just not the truth. And Jesus never told us that that's the way it was going to be. And the opposite is often true. Satan works that much harder on us to get us back. He throws that much more at us. So those temptations get even stronger. And life can be often hard and painful. And we've experienced a lot of those kinds of things in our lives. And so they, today we're going to ask that tough question. How do I say no to temptation? It can be hard to learn to say no to some things and saying no to certain people. It just seems to be very difficult for us on at times. We may feel a, a twinge of temptation towards an affair. Or our minds may get filled with ugly and hateful thoughts, especially as you're driving on I-95. But, uh, or we're tempted to drink, even though we know what it does to us and to our family. We're tempted towards anger or inactivity or laziness. Or we wonder if we'll ever be able to conquer these temptations that we're just bombarded with all the time. It just seem to come. We may act as if everything's under control and everything's okay, but inside we're wondering, why can't I stop this? Why can't I overcome this? Why can't I just be free of all of these temptations that keep coming my way? Now, some may even use the excuse, that's just the way I am. You know, that's just the way I am. And don't worry about it because, you know, that's just the way I am. I'm tempted in that way. But they're simply allowing temptation then to control their lives. And that's not what God had in store for his people. Not that temptation should control their lives. But sometimes they just say, that's just the way I am. I've tried, I've failed, I get knocked down and again and again. And so they're just tempted to just give in and give up. Today I hope to give you some practical advice from an expert in temptation. No, it's not me, although uh, I, I'm a close second, but I want to look at what God has to say about dealing with temptation. He is really an expert on it. He knows all about it, and he knows how to help us to overcome it and grow through it, and that's the point we want to make. The Bible gives us four practical steps in dealing with temptation, in facing temptation. Step number one, we must recognize the source of our temptation. That's the first key. We need to identify the source of that temptation. Where does it come from? What causes me to say yes to temptation? Who's responsible for this temptation and who's responsible for it being so strong in my life you know a lot of people blame God I just can't help it God made me that way you know so they blame God that's the way God made me he gave me these desires and I can't help it some blame Satan like the great theologian Flip Wilson 
The devil made me do it. That's just their, their excuse. That's what they want to say. You know, I can't help it. The devil made me do it, and I just can't help it. And the devil's getting into my machine again. I was wise enough to bring my back up with me just in case. I don't know what's getting into this other than the devil's getting into my machine here. Tempting me to get angry or something. I don't know what it is. Now, let's face it. The devil is involved in our temptations. We've got to admit that. He is involved in it. Um, he sends us the invitation, so to speak, to, uh, to, temp to temptation or to whatever it is. But we're the ones that accept the invitation. So we're the ones that have to take responsibility for it. Now, some like to blame others. If they hadn't done that or if they hadn't done this, then I wouldn't have been tempted to do that. And so we like to blame others for their problems, for our problems, and for why it's not happening the way I would like it to be. And blame is simply a way of putting off the responsibility for our own actions onto someone else when it really is our own issue. And we'll never fix our problems as long as we try to fix the blame on others. We've got to recognize the source of our temptation. James 1, 13 and 14 says this, When you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. So don't use that as an excuse, that God is tempting me. Temptations come from our own desires. So don't blame God. It's our own desires. That's the root source of our temptation. Yes, the devil is involved. He sends the invitations for that temptation, but we're the ones that accept it, as I said earlier. So we've got to get to the root cause, and the root cause is us and our own desires. So be honest. When we're the one making the choice to do wrong, who's really at fault here? It's us. This verse says temptation is a lure. Now that's a fishing term, and I'm not a big fisherman, but I do understand about lures, and, and lures also have something in them, don't they? A hook. It looks good, but that lure has a hook in it. And lures have hooks, and sin works much the same way. Sin looks good. It looks tempting, but there's always a hook attached to that temptation. Now, experienced fish recognize the lure, and stay away from it. Uh, I, I know I've done that. I've seen the fish there, and I've thrown the bait out, the lure out, and I'm thinking, boy, it's going to take it. It just, no. Or if they're really smart, or if you're a bad fisherman, I don't know which one it is, they go ahead and take the bait without touching the hook. I don't know how they know how to do that, but they do it. They'll come, and, and you'll feel the nibble, and you'll tug, and think you're going to hook the fish, and then pretty soon you'd reel it in and there's no bait on top of it, or no bait on the hook anymore. They took the bait, but not the hook. But that's not the way sin lots of times happens with us. We take it hook, line, and sinker. We just boom, right on to that sin. It looks good, it looks tempting, and we get hooked. Likewise, it's a sign of maturity when in our lives when we recognize the lure of temptation and stay away from it like those experienced fish. Recognize it for what it is. It's a temptation with a hook in it. Let's not give in to that. And there are may, three main sources of temptation in our life. The world is a source of temptation. The whole world, the way society looks at things, the way society has accepted things, and the things that society does, and on television, the things that are portrayed as being okay, being acceptable to society. And we can really get tied into that. We can really start accepting these things as being okay. But it's not. 1 John 2, 12, uh, 16 explains, there are ways of the world wanting to please our sinful selves, wanting the sinful things we see and being too proud of what we have. There are temptations in the world, and we need to recognize that as one of the sources of temptation. The next is ourself, as I already was mentioning earlier. Our wants and our desires, as James stated in, in chapter 1, verse 14. 
And Paul also says this in Galatians 5, 16. He says this, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Our sinful nature within us is the source of much of our temptation. Our desires, our evil thoughts, our evil desires. And third, yes, as I said, the devil is involved. There really is a source of evil in the world. You know, I just don't understand how people can say they don't believe in the devil. They just don't think the devil is real. How can you not when you see our world and the way it is? There really is a source of evil in the world and it's called the devil. There really is someone wanting to ruin our lives and especially all new believers. So first we must make we must recognize the source of our temptation. Step two, we must refuse to feel guilty about temptation. We don't need to feel guilty about the fact that temptations come. A lot of people do, but we don't need to feel that. Some, say, uh, some do, and, and uh, they, they wonder, how in the world can I think about things like that? How can that be? I must not be saved if I can possibly think of those mean, hateful, evil things. They say something must be wrong with them to think such thoughts. But Hebrews 4.15 says this, Jesus has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Now if Jesus wasn't exempt from temptation, why should we think that we will be? He experienced it just like we did. But he was without sin. There is a difference between temptation and sin. We shouldn't feel guilty about being tempted. We shouldn't feel guilty if we give in to the temptation and, and do the sin. But Jesus was tempted. But he didn't sin. So it's not a sin to be tempted. The goal is, like in Jesus' case, to not let temptation cause us to sin. Romans 8 1 states this So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus says, If you come to me, if you will trust in me, I'll take away your sins and I'll pay the penalty for your sin. And there's no need for you to feel guilty anymore for those past sins and no reason to feel guilty if we're tempted. Step three. We must remember we're not alone. Sometimes people think that I'm the only one that's ever been tempted this way. I'm all by myself in this. I'm the only one with a problem. Well, I assure you, you're not. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. Remember this. The wrong desires that come into your life aren't anything new and different. Many others have faced exactly the same problems before you. The Bible assures us that temptation is common to each and every one of us. We all have experienced it. We all will continue to experience it until we're dead. A survey asked Christians this. What are the common temptations that you've faced? Now here are the top responses. See which one fits you. <laughs> Number one was materialism. Number two was pride. Number three was self-centeredness. Number four was laziness. Number five and number six was a tie between anger and bitterness and then lust. Number seven was envy. Number eight was gluttony. And number nine was lying. Now, actually, uh, lying was number one, but I lied about it. <laughs> but the same survey also said this. What is it that made temptation worse for you? Listen carefully to this. What made it worse for you when you were tempted? 81% said, when I didn't spend time with God. 81% recognized that as the weakness in their dealing with temptation. 57% said, when I was physically tired. So we need to be aware of that. 
when we don't spend time with God and when we're physically tired, we're much more susceptible to sin. So we need to make sure that we're doing those two things well. Getting our rest and spending the time we need to be spending with God. And they were asked, what helps you to overcome temptation? Well, this was no surprise. What number one was, it was talking to God about it. Prayer, spending time with God. 84% said that was the source that they used to help them. 76% said avoiding compromising situations. Staying out of the places and, the, and doing the things that would bring about those temptations. Watching or, or reading uh, the things that would bring about those temptations. 66% said looking at what the Bible says about it. So they recognized the temptation and they immediately went into God's word to see what God's word had to say about it. 52% said talking with another person about it. In other words, being held accountable with another person. Sharing with them, I'm dealing with this right now. Can you help me? Can you pray for me? Can you support me and encourage me in this area? So let's be real about who we are and how we're tempted. That's what we really need to do. Take a step back, really look at ourselves, look at the things that have come about that really tempts us and what perhaps were we doing that may be added to that area of temptation. And there are three major areas of temptation. Number one is our passions. When we allow our body and mind to control us in regard to anything, regarding sex or food or drink or anything else, when we allow the passions and the desires within ourselves to overtake us. And even perhaps when we use something uh, good but in a wrong way or for the wrong reason. And we let, again, our desires to control us. Number two is our possessions. It has to go back to the materialism that was talked about earlier. When things become our reason for living and we can't keep from buying more things, we get our self-esteem, we get our uh, feeling good about ourselves by buying things. That's an indication that there's a problem. When we're allowing that to be our temptation to just spend and spend and spend and buy and buy and buy when we're driven by what we have and when we're trying to impress other people by what we have that's a temptation and third pride the temptation to have power or influence over others and to get our own way at any cost so what is the real solution to this temptation all right, you've identified the temptations, you've identified some of the things that, that can affect us and influence us, but how do we deal with this? What's the solution to temptation? That's step number four. We must choose God's way out. Let's look at the promise from God found in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. The question is, are we going to take it? Do we take that way out or do we ignore that way out? So that's why step four is to choose God's way out. That's the key to temptation. God promises us that there will always be a way out if we will take it. He promises that there's no temptation that's irresistible. We may think that there are. I just can't help myself. There's, that's just the way God made me, as we talked about earlier. I can't help it. It's irresistible to me. No, God says that is not the case. I will always provide a way out for you if you'll take it. The problem is we often wait until we're nine-tenths of the way in before we ever ask God for his way out. That's too late. When we're already that far committed, it's too late to now ask for God. That temptation is extremely strong at that point. We do stupid things and then want God to back us out of this and get us out of that. You know, we buy donuts and we bring them home and we set them on the table and then we ask God to help us with our diet. That, 
We decide to go out to eat. What do we choose to go to? A buffet, Golden Corral, something like that, where the food's just there. You can go back and back and back and back. God, help me with my diet. We need to think about these things a little beforehand. We need to ask God a little bit beforehand. We need to ask before we do these things. While we're thinking about them, not as we're on our way there or as we've already paid our money and then we say, well, I already paid for it. i got to go eat it now. You know, it's before you get to that point. So we need to ask God for the help. Matthew 6.13 encourages us to pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. But we need to pray and ask for that help to never get into that situation in the first place. We need the strength outside of ourselves to do this. We need God's strength and help. And we get that through prayer. James 1, 2 says, When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Now, how many have welcomed the temptations your way as friends? Not too many of us would. We tend not to do that. How can we do that? Well, when temptations come and we say the right thing and we do the right thing and we choose God's way out, guess what happens? We are strengthened. So that's what James is saying. He's saying, don't worry about them. Don't resist them. And don't, well, resist them, but <laughs> don't resent them is the word I was looking for. Don't resent them. Use them as an opportunity to grow even stronger. As we say no, as we don't do it, as we ask God for his help, as he sees us through, and as we are then strengthened. We become more of who God wants us to be, a strong believer. So what is God's way out of temptation? The way out of temptation is a three-letter word. Run! Run! Listen to what 2 Timothy 2.22 says. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Now, look at this verse carefully. It tells us three very important things. We're going to go through them quickly, but please catch them. We must run away from temptation. That should be our first response. Not give it a second thought, not to give it some thinking about it, you know, and considering it. Run! Number two, we must run toward righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Run to the right things. Run to the right sources. Run to God. And three, we run enjoying the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. In other words, we are to be running along with other Christians, other strong Christians who are doing it right, who've already overcome much of the temptations in their life and can help us along the way and can be an encouragement to us, can be an accountability partner for us, can be someone who can help us to keep that pure lifestyle. We surround ourselves with people who are wanting to live that way that will encourage us to also live that way. Now how do we deal with habitual sin? in our lives well first of all we have to break the pattern instead of saying yes to those temptations every time we say yes to God's way out of it you may say I just never see a way out well it's because you're not looking for it and you're not asking God for it because he promises that there is one we have to break that pattern we run away from it and we run towards righteous things we run toward God we run with the right crowd, a crowd that will support and encourage us and not add to the temptations. We also need to stop thinking about the temptation and start thinking more about God. Have you ever had a temptation come and you sat and just dwelled on that? 
You dwelt on the temptation. You dwelt on, okay, this is what I got to do. This is how, I can't do this. No, I can't do that. Boy, but that's, wow, that's such a strong temptation. Boy, it's just, it's just surrounding me. Boy, the devil's really hitting me right now. What are you doing? You're thinking about it. How about thinking about the moment it comes, I got to think about God and righteousness and purity, and I got to pray to God, and I've got to look for God, and I've got to seek his wisdom and his, his help and his way out of this. Then you're changing the focus of what you're thinking about. Stop thinking about the temptation. Start thinking about God. Because the more we think about it and struggle with it, the more we're, we're fighting that tug of war with Satan. And you need to stop that. How do you win a tug of war? You drop the rope. You stop the fight. Let Satan have the rope. You talk, you just drop it and walk away and walk to God. We remove ourselves from the battle and we stand up with God. Have you ever been driving down the road and something kind of catches your eye on the side of the road and you start looking at it while you're driving? What happens to the car? I had an accident that way one time. It wasn't that I was looking at something. It was I noticed something on the, my back seat started to fall. And so I reached back and was trying to deal with that that was falling. And boom, ran right into the car next to me. Stupid. But where you have your eyes, that's where you go. So we got to get our eyes off of the temptation and get our eyes on God. And keep them on the road. You know, stop looking at things on the side. It's what we focus on. So stop focusing on the temptation and start focusing on God. Jesus gave us that example. What did he do when Satan was tempting him in the desert? He quoted scripture. His focus was not on what Satan was tempting him about. His focus went straight to God and God's word. His way was to focus on God and his word, and it kept his thoughts on track, and it will for us as well. So how do I say no to temptation? I say yes to God. I say yes to God. Yes to his formula for dealing with temptation. Yes to his plan for my life. Yes to my marriage, yes to my words, yes to my attitudes, to the way I handle money, to the way I treat people, to all of those things I say yes to God's way. And it all begins by saying yes to God's gift of eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ, who died to take away our sins. Have you said yes to Jesus already? Wonderful. Wonderful. If you haven't, say yes to Jesus today. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, temptation is common to all of us. We all deal with it. We all struggle with it. But Lord, you've provided a way out. You've provided the answers. You've provided a step-by-step -step plan. Lord, may we now listen to your plan, put your plan of action into action, and gain the victory over those things that come our way. And especially if we're dealing with a habitual sin. Lord, I pray your special strength and power. Stop focusing on that sin and start focusing on you and your way. Speak to our hearts here, Lord Jesus, I pray.